Hello, everyone. This is Aranam, Educator of Philosophy, which you probably know by now, but we're going to keep introducing ourselves <laughs> as a matter of habit. Um, I am in, in um, Austin, Texas, and I am doing all of these beautiful conversations with my great friend, Tren. Hello, Tren. Hello, hello. This is Tren, your friend. Um, hi, Aran. Nice to see you again. And uh, this is Tren. I'm a cultural historian of early media of Europe and later media of China. Um, usually based in Austin, Texas, a wonderful place, really, if you've got a chance to visit us. Um, uh, but as of for now, I'm doing archive in, in, in Paris, yet another brilliant town. So good to be with you guys. Great. So, Trent, could you tell us, give, give us a little bit of a, a summary of what we discussed last time and where we are headed this in this episode? Yes, um, as our listeners might be well aware at this point that we are coming through Hegel's The Science of Logic with the guide of uh, Stephen Hulgate's book, uh, The Opening of uh, Hegel's Logic. And uh, that book it has a, uh, a detailed study of uh, Hegel's the project and relating it with the other philosophers' sort of ideas as well as um, it goes through the contemporary reception interpretation as well as misinterpretations of Hegel's um, book um, as it is an intro, very extensive introduction. Then this follows by um, a bilingual version of the Hegel's sections of Hegel's text. So we're using it for the like for, for several months, I'll say, um, to orient ourselves towards the Hegel's um, philosophical world. And because we believe that's the most, uh, um, it, it's a centerpiece of his sort of thing, uh, the project to, to connect all his um, interests and, um, and findings together. So um, as for the beginning of this um, series of episodes on Hegel's logic, we started with, contextualizing him in the history of Western philosophy. Then we um, moved on to the con possible reaction towards the radical, radical nature of the Hegel's uh, project, namely to start a philosophical system without any presupposition. And in our last episode, we uh, presented the, one of the first of the three attitudes towards um, Hegel's project, the three are um, the project is, is impossible, uh, meaning like it would be great if we have a, such a presupposition less project, but it's impossible. It's beyond the human reason or capacity. Second is to be meaningless, absurd. We will talk about that in the future. And the third, of course, it's, in the future is useless. And today we are connecting our this project, this episode with the previous one, which we detailed the typology of why different thinkers consider this project as impossible. So it's a, a specification of the first attitude. So it's a very uh, detailed, complex. That also got your classification correct. And um, and right now today, Arun and I will reply to those charges and basically defend that Hegel's project at least the prima facie upon external examination without reading his, um, his text cannot be classified as impossible. So it might fail. So we're not demonstrating it's been valid or successful, but at least it's not impossible in the sense that those thinkers consider this project as impossible. So we should be confident that a certain insight will be generated in reading his text, even if it fails. So that's basically where we are at this moment. Back to you, Aron. Yeah. We're gonna do today. Yes, and with that, I think we are ready to see why we think the charge that, you know, this claim of presuppositionlessness is a non-starter. Like how this claim fails based on what Hegel is demanding from us. And, the way to kind of decipher this point, which is, you know, it's a very, I think, a natural reaction to Hegel's science of logic. And this is something that I've had a before uh, engaging with Hegel in general, that it seems there's something, what do you mean presuppositionless? It seems like we are all, always, there is something that we have. And it, it, it sounds, it is very, intuitively plausible to think that there is something 
uh, wrong with this claim. But I think this attitude will be pacified if we appreciate the distinction that uh, Holgate gives a couple of names to, but I think the most uh, interesting version of this distinct, um, distinction is distinguishing between founding presuppositions and enabling presuppositions. And I think most of this episode will be our attempt to kind of make sense of what is the, what is the difference between the two and why that difference matters and why that shows all of those charges that we brought up against uh, Hegel as charges of impossibility, which again, we are very much interested in hearing if you have more charges to, that we didn't uh, have talked about. But why all of those charges are conflating the distinction between founding and enabling presuppositions. So in beginning of Hegel's logic, Holgate writes, Hegel's logic does have certain historical and hermeneutic presuppositions, but these do not predetermine the course or the outcome of a speculative logic. They cannot do so because they require philosophers or enable them to consider nothing beyond the indeterminate being of thought. Insofar as the speculative philosophy begins from such indeterminacy, it has no founding presupposition and is thus, in Hegel's sense, presuppositionless. So what is happening here in this distinction is basically our task in this episode with the help of Holgate is to locate presuppositionlessness, right? Because one thing is clear and acknowledged by Hegel himself, that he doesn't think that his version of presuppositionlessness implies no presuppositions, period, in a comprehensive way. But it is about different types of presuppositions that matters in this story, which I mean, you know, we, we, we kind of have a sense of Hegel's acknowledgement of this with what we discussed, I believe, two episodes ago or, or, or three episodes ago about that image of learning how to swim without touching water, without jumping into water. Like that's Hegel's charge against other philosophers that they want to kind of abstract from everything in, in the wrong way of doing that and still being engaged with concepts. And he, in, for instance, in philosophy, Wright also mentions that philosophy has no other choice than just beginning. Uh, it's not gonna, there is, there is gonna be that, that point. What he is doing is not then the rejection of enabling presuppositions, but he is inviting us to give up all founding presuppositions about being, and the distinction between being and thought. And to demystify this point, we can begin with kind of delving into what Hegel acknowledges as the enabling presuppositions of the project of logic. Trent, do you have anything to say at this point? No, not really. It's um, very clear. And I particularly like the way Hogate clarifies the or Hegel himself clarifies the distinction between founding and enabling. I think that when I was reading it, the the, the, the primary feeling I got is founding prepositions of which the Hegel accuses uh, or demonstrates um Descartes and um can help were those prepositions that were not aware uh, the, the philosophers were not even aware of when the, the Descartes was using cogito. He did not n realize that, or he didn't want to acknowledge that he smuggled the concept of self in. Whereas for Hegel, he was a hyper self sensitive, self critical in the sense, if he was using something as an enabling presupposition, he would not build his whole system based on a decontextualized and fixed form of that thing, which I think for me it makes all the difference because then the whole enterprise is not built upon certain unexamined conviction but rather 
it's like using language. You can use language to deconstruct language in the sense that then the Conan stories, like they are using language to tell you there's a limit that a language cannot get. That's, I think, the key difference between, say, fun funding and the, um, enabling preservation. So I think we should proceed. I think that's a great point. I, I will add one very short thing to what you said to just kind of summarize and condense it. Hegel's criticism of Descartes and Kant is not that they have enabling presuppositions. No. But Hegel's charge is that they have founding presuppositions about the relation between being and thought or subject and object, for instance. So that in, in that with that kind of a distinction, we can also understand the distinction or the definitive character of Hegel's criticism of Descartes and Kant as well. Now, the enable and hermeneutical presuppositions of Hegel's logic, according to Holgate, include all sorts of things. And well, one of which is just, you know, if you cannot abstract for all, all sorts of reasons, it could be some level of mental disability. It could be just like someone is so absorbed in their emotions they cannot, you know, come up with like, and I think it's a very old idea in philosophy. This whole thing that you know, if you don't know geometry, you cannot be allowed um, to uh, to the club. It's, it's it's a similar thing. It's not necessarily geometry, but it's just like if you cannot, you know, get beyond examples or emotions, Hegel's logic is not gonna begin for you. Not because there is any problem with Hegel's logic, but because you are not in that position to even consider it. Uh, so, you know, that's that's something that is very important in that uh, matter, that, that kind of a capacity. But also it's about material conditions. I mean, if you're dying from hunger, you're not gonna think about being probably or the way that you're going to think about it is going to be very different from this, this type of uh, consideration. So there has to be other conditions in life that makes it possible for you to be in the position of considering this. And these are more general points. Um, but it is interesting that Hegel thinks that there are aspects of modernity and reformation in Christianity or religion that are also part of this um, series of enabling conditions, that he thinks that this desire for critical self-scrutiny, it's something about a modern shape of life, right? If you are in a historical period or geographical position, that in no way this shows itself as a desire, of course, you're not going to pursue it, right? If you're living in a, you know, whatever, religious fundamentalist space that is just, just asking questions is not encouraged, and that's part of the education system, I'm just making this up, then you get that type of critical self-scrutiny does not even come into view. That's not to say that critical self-scrutiny is impossible. That's just saying that for self critical self-scrutiny to be there, some other things should be in place as well. No, it's um, it's just very interesting for me to observe that parts of the Hegel's um, enabling, which is non-funding presuppositions to consider the um, historical uh, development of mankind, basically. Like education and abstraction, I was uh, immediately thinking of like the so-called invention of language, the cognitive term in the human evolution. So before human beings were able to use symbolic forms of communication, I don't think Hegel's logic was meaningful, possible, or like had audience at all. And also, on the other hand, it also consider things that is more in our, it's not a historical in the strictly chronological sense, 
but it concerns the social institution or the relationship between uh, among uh, members of a society. Like uh, you, you can very well imagine a society that had already evident traits of what Hegel considered necessary for, say, um, such a project in the um, 18th century, like say London. But as there are certain societies that are according to Hegel, even a couple of centuries later still do not reach that state. So strict chronology is not necessarily the defining feature of that historical. That's my my, my take. So it, it seems like there are multiple uh, spheres that are taken into consideration when Hegel had in mind proposing the um, distinction between founding and enabling. I find that really fascinating. That's why as a cultural historian, I'm really into this and to see how this connects with um, Hegel's connect, uh, interpretation of uh, cultural evolution, stuff of that kind. Yes. Yeah, I, I think it's very interesting. Yeah, as you said, I don't think there is anything chronological, even in the like spaces that Hegel thinks, you know, the modern institutions emerge first. Like there is always the possibility of relapse. Right. And when relapse happens, then possibility of critical self scrutiny evaporates as well. Right. It's a very interesting thing. This is always contingent upon those conditions because there is no guarantee, just we have seen in the 20th century, there's no guarantee that a, a, spa a place that had some modern institutions do not collapse into a space that is not, right. uh, that type of activity is not encouraged. And in that type of a space, something like logic, the spirit of science of logic, it's just impossible to, you know, even think of, although it is from that region or space or cultural um, network, it becomes even, I think, interesting in terms of this kind of cultural comparisons that this, this spread of critical self-scrutiny today might be moving to a completely different place than Germany. I'm not saying that it is doing, but that's something that is absolutely thinkable that right. Hegel's logic could start to really make sense to a more self-critical group of people that for all sorts of contingent reasons uh, emerge in a different place in the world. So definitely the, uh, Hegel is aware of these conditions, but these conditions are not anything about the presuppositions that, that Hegel would be concerned about. Now, before moving to that, moving to what is a pre like locating presuppositionlessness, what is a founding presupposition that Hegel wants to disregard? Um, there is the last point. There is this the religion point. That Hegel seems to have this idea that the ability of letting go is a religious act or only in a religious space that idea of letting go is possible. And because of that, from what I understood, he would think that, I'm sure he would think all sorts of religions could be in that category, right? But maybe some others are not going to be conducive to this act of letting go. And I'm not sure... I'm not sure about that point in general. Not that I'm, I'm not sure, not in the sense that I have um, an articulated criticism against it, but I'm not sure what exactly he is going for. So Trent, do, do you have an idea of what, what is- no, what is very, very unfortunately, Hegel is not part of uh, our uh, religious education curriculum, even though I'm uh, unfortunately in the uh, Department of Religious Studies. The thing is, um, I have some hunch, that's about it. We should definitely read Hegel's writing about religion um, directly, perhaps after, like some in, in the foreseeable future, and to see how this connects with um, his overall, say, science of logic and other cultural history writing. My hunch is um, religion might be, especially I'm making like assumption here, like, based on, on Hegel's time and place, um, he's perhaps talking about um, certain form of Protestant Christianity, which to a large extent foregrounds 
concept of、uh, subjectivity or individuality through making really explicit certain concepts like free will, or at least put them at the forefront of the discussion, theological debates. Like in,、um, you are responsible for your action, and you must let go. I don't know, maybe your. Historical or cultural norms, even though the whole society around you ask you to do certain things, but you're gonna hold on to something else which is not evidently、uh, a beneficiary to you in many other domains. But you will become a you'll become safe later later on. So it's completely different understanding between individual and their immediate social understanding. The the will to break, perhaps like. Norms, sort of、uh, assumptions, and passed on to them, forced upon them by their immediate community. That's just wild speculation. But、uh, I think the concept of subjectivity is very much likely to be on、uh, Hegel's mind when he was using specific types of religion to as as an example of the enabling presuppositions. That's that, that's just a guess. Yes. That's a very interesting guess. Yeah, I, I agree that we we need to delve into the point、uh, of religion in general、uh, in later projects. But I think that there there is definitely something about that. Yeah, the ability to let go in the sense that you describe, especially in Christianity and and, and its the um its relationship with it, with its with the dominant cultures that he, he, he was around and that kind of like. Being able to find oneself in, in very different ways and different practices of、um, maybe even、um, some in some ways confessional、uh, aspects in bringing out that、um, individuality and subjectivity to to the、um, picture. But let's expand on that later on. We've got、uh, <laughs> we've got we've got a lot here. So. I think this is like what is like we are now ready to reconsider one of the quotes that we shared with you before, and also another quote that is from、uh, Holgate to really understand that what is presuppositionless in Hegel, and what is not. We already know what is not, right? If your abstraction, either in the way that Trent was mentioning, the very basic cognitive capacity of symbolic communication. Or what I mentioned, which is like being able to kind of abstract from what is just present to you,、right. um, which is also related to letting go. If you're not able to do that, you're not re- you're not in the position of、um, starting logic. That doesn't mean what logic is doing is impossible. Like if I say that you need to look at this image and You are covering your eyes. It doesn't matter whether my I'm telling you this image is so and so. You、right. are not in the position of judging whether I'm right or wrong because you are not looking. Look, and then you can object. All these enabling conditions are like being able to start looking, and. Abstraction is one of that. Letting go is one of that. This kind of interest in self scrutiny is one of that. And of course, there could be like someone need like Nietzsche showing up and telling us that oh maybe this this type of self scrutiny is contingent or or even not useful in some senses. But that's not anything about impossibility. It's possible. What once that desire is there, the project is not impossible. And the reason for that is that Hegel's science of logic, according to Bolkin, is presuppositionless in so far as it confirms with the modern demand for radical self-criticism that requires us to suspend all our founding presuppositions about thought and being. That's where the presuppositionlessness lives. We are not getting rid of all presuppositions. We are getting rid of a very specific presupposition, and that presupposition is about thought and being, in distinction making. Going back to what we have pointed out 
throughout our, our conversations here that um, Hegel's problem with Descartes and Kant in this sense becomes clear that it's with their founding presuppositions about thought and being, right? right about thinking of uh, already presupposing a distinction by carrying, pursuing the task of uh, guaranteeing certainty. Certainty is only a problem if there is a subject and there is an object and there is a relation and that relation is uncertain. But if I show up and say that where should we start? Why should we start there? Let's start from an undifferentiated being, a being that is just there, a being that is not even being. a being that is not even presupposing a distinction between being a thing or being a thought. You mm, see, right. in the way that I was, I tried to point at in uh, an, a couple of episodes ago about children. I think that's very important. Like this incapacity of distinguishing between fiction and reality in the sense of like, what is an quote unquote object of thought is also an object of existence. What right. is a thought is, what is it? What is a thought is also is, it has being right? That thought and being. I think that's very close to what um, Hegel has in mind here, that thought and being, the distinction between the two is not something that we need to start from that distinction. We, we could only start from being. And because of that, all of those distinctions start to evaporate. It's not a being of a table or being of an idea. It's not about being of a subject or being of object. It's just being, it's mm -hmm. all being. In a combination of a kid's mind and a mystic's mind, this is, this is something that is a valid position to have, right? Now, if that's the presupposition that we're giving up, none of those charges touch that presupposition because sure Kierkegaard is right we need to decide to stop there is no power plant working on its own right we need to you know push the switches that doesn't that doesn't change anything about this the, the point is to to have this uh, distinction suspended and focus on being as immediacy and the reason we are focusing on uh, being as immediacy itself, as, as Hegel says it, he says it must be the beginning may not presuppose anything. Consequently, it must be purely and simply an immediacy, or rather, immediacy, merely immediacy itself, is to kind of forget about abstraction and mediation altogether as well, right? Because Hegel knows that we achieve this immediacy by like kind of getting rid of stuff, the abstracting from stuff. But he wants to say, don't even think about this as this mediation. Think about someone who is there already, who has forgotten that this has been the process of reaching immediacy. Because then we will give immediacy all do, you know, what it's due is given because then it would be very easy to disregard immediacy because you would say, oh, immediacy was just a result of abstractions. No, 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 think about just immediacy. That's it, immediacy. Immediacy, which is named pure being and these terms could be interchangeable. And as we are gonna say in the last bit of this conversation, this kind of like words are not the point here. Uh, the, the, these ideas are um, important. So in this sense, I think Hegel is immune from the charges, at least the ones that we have considered of uh, presupposing things because he's, he doesn't have any problem with presupposing all sorts of things. There's one thing that he doesn't want to presuppose anything about and that's the relationship between thought and being about what being is and uh, 
he formulates that absence of distinction and differentiation by formulating being as immediacy as such. Right. Thanks. That's very helpful. Um, um, just uh, imagine myself as a listener listening to what you just said. And I just want to reassure our listeners that uh, today's purpose is not to, to really um, explain the implications and perhaps the background of this um, uh, proposal of uh, Hegel's that we started with the thought and the being and with their relationship. Could we possibly start with other a category and to start this project we will do that in some future episodes today we're just trying to emphasize that where does um hegel's presupposition list locate and it's nothing more than that so if you're curious if you feel yourself like want to know more about it great because we're going to talk about that in the sh very short future yeah shall we proceed perfect Yes. So the last bit that we're going to talk about in terms of the charge of impossibility that I, I'm curious to hear uh, what, what you have to say is that a specific point about language, right? Because that charge seems to be a little bit different um, than others, maybe. The whole gate holds that he, he writes that language and its ordinary furniture does not constitute a founding presupposition of the logic, this was the necessary use of it. Mm. This is because the ordinary meanings of the words and concepts that Hegel must presuppose and employ do not themselves determine the course of his derivation of categories from the thought of pure being. And I am I have ambivalent feelings about this statement, not because I'm endorsing Gadamer, but I think it's it needs to be addressed more robustly and i think in our conversations unrecorded conversations <laughs> we uh we got into like a case and that is like okay the, the words the ordinary meanings of them does not you know determine the course of the derivation of categories but what about we're thinking about a language that does not have these concepts at all like what is logic to those languages and if logic is not possible in those languages does that mean that actually there is something about german that constitutes like a founding presupposition of this inquiry or not so i, I want you to right. tell us a little bit more about this right um it's a very tricky one. Even the example itself, it's a, a it's not a waterproof, and it's a, to us, I think it's problematic because sort of language. It, it touches on the question whether thinking process is really transparent to the uh, linguistic act or speech. Like, do languages really reflect or vocabulary really reflect our thinking categories? But having that. Sort of, Proviso said, um, I was thinking immediately of, say, early Chinese, while, like, the, be before China had its empire in the uh, late 3rd century BCE, um, while reading the, this passage, especially Hegel's the project start with pure being, and or being is, like, a central. It's one of the two pillars of this whole project. And I couldn't think of a word that is the, the cultural equivalent to the concept of a 18th or early 19th century German sein or being um, to in, in early Chinese. And if you, a lot of communication that it were down through, say, poetic form and the poet from just throwing imageries, like terms out. And you, you say, oh, here's a bird, here's a river, here's a lady, here's her mate, stuff like that. And it, and in the poem itself, it's just naming things, and there's no is to connect them. And it's up to the listeners, perhaps, to, to, to come up with a relationship or anything. And it's not even clear whether that name, that sound, really helps them to locate a very distinct thing or not. It was more a type of that thing, so universal individual again. So um, 
But on the other hand, there of course, as a historian, I must say there are a lot of documentary problem to this suggestion using especially so-called dead language because so we, what we got is a documentation of speech act which is filtered like through institutions and material conditions that ancient Chinese might well have used the term being in their communication in their chat it's just that such words not preserved and therefore not subject to our scrutiny but uh, even if we entertain that, say, early Chinese really did not at least make this category being as the central piece of their verbal communication, at least they desired the verbal communication they desired for their prosperity to record and promulgate. We, I'm personally not sure whether that means that such a category is absent from early Chinese mind at all. I think um, to a certain extent, it is an assumption, at least, or perhaps supposition in my eyes, to say, if you follow Gautama's trend, say, if you would do, say, um, social linguistic analysis in a certain community during a certain period, that is such a term is not really used. That doesn't seem to me directly translated to the conclusion that um, the Hegelian, but the Hegel's project of logic is intrinsically German. It's in. It's only possible because it was a speaking German. I I do not agree with that because whenever you are naming different things, like a kid could not say with his or her parents that like what's connection between an orange and an apple? Then they would say, well, they are all fruits. So what's the connection between say an orange and a bird? Are they all like animate beings? And what's the connection between this piece of like a break and that like bird. Uh, there are something. There is something. I think that this, I desire to speculate. I'm not, I don't want to use the word abstract here, but like just a more quotidian way to, to, to associate and differentiate a contrast to compare things named or names, pure names, um, would eventually lead us. Uh, not necessarily eventually, but like it's highly likely that a word prompt a member of a certain linguistic community to think about the search and um, attribute or condition or category, even though this linguistic community does not put this term, in this case, being at the forefront of their linguistic communication, verbal communication. That's uh, that's my reflection on that. Did that make yeah, sense? I, th I, I think I, I am uh, aligned with you there because I... I was thinking about this in a different way like, because I'm working on some, uh, you know, history of uh, political institutions in the U.S. Right. And I am uh, like um, communicating that in Farsi, and it is, you know, there are many moments that I stumble upon an English word that has a meaning in English. Right. And. It is also not a very complicated word in English, meaning that you will hear people talking about it that are not, you know, necessarily philosophers, right? Give us like, an example, concrete example. Um, agency. Okay, agency. Agency, and I think I've heard people use the term agency in the English-speaking uh, domain that are definitely not like philosophy students. Uh, or they are just like they, they talk about um, claiming or agency and I'm sure like so there are other concepts that are less you know common but still have meaning like sovereignty right that right. also use in this all sorts of like political debates and even like concepts such as whistleblower right mm -hmm. it is not like it's just like a character it's like a, someone who is revealing you know secrets right for the benefit of like for okay. disclosing corruption right and getting like a law that protects that right that's not that's not that doesn't exist in iran that's right. not how how it works right so sure none of these words that i mentioned have any equivalent right in Farsi, of course, they have some sort of equivalent, but their equivalents are rather awkward or they are not really, you cannot communicate. If I go and use that word, 
with someone who doesn't know agency in English, you see what I'm saying? They are not going to understand what is why I'm, what am I talking about? Right. Like there are words, but they're artificially there. Right. That yeah. doesn't mean that Iranians do not have agency. Oh, yeah. That just means that uh, that aspect of uh, that hasn't become in the, uh, that hasn't come to the forefront of our thought. That hasn't become explicit in our linguistic expressions. Now that doesn't mean that also that doesn't mean that anything that we come up as you know in our analysis of what agency is our discoveries are going to be applicable to Iranians as well just because they don't have the word for it that doesn't mean that like if we fi find whatever like I'm just making this this up that agency is just you know, scientifically reducible to scientific phenomenon. This is the chemical aspects of agency. That just that's attributable to Iranian people as much as anyone else. Or if you think right. about agency, is something that is always historically situated. It doesn't matter that Iranians do not have the same type of access to the concept of agency in an explicit way. That is applicable to them as well. So the the, the way, and this is the last thing I'm going to say is the way that I think about this kind of the dominance of language or the, the relevance of that language and why I think it's not a founding presupposition in the way that we have uh, tried to dissect here is the fact that just because it, you know, a Pacific lang uh, Islander language cannot accommodate the language of quantum mechanics, that doesn't mean quantum mechanics does not e exist or is not valid. Like the fact that the language is not able to formulate something, it just means that it cannot formulate that thing. It doesn't mean anything more than that. It's not accessible to that language and it's not accessible to that culture. Fine. That is not to say that that thing is, doesn't exist or that inquiry is invalid because it's only possible in these languages and on top of that i think that hegel's logic is actually expressible in farsi mm -hmm. and my, i have some ideas from conversing with you that is also expressible in chinese However, this point becomes its own side fascinating issue, which right. is more about translation, right. which I think the translation of Hegel's logic to Farsi, it is not a translation of the text that Hegel has written, hmm. but it is reconstruction of the essence of Hegel's logic in light of the capacities of Farsi. It's a recreation more than a simple translation. The point may need to, the beginning might need to be, and did it be different? The introduction to the project needs to be different. But if Hegel has, let's just assume for the second, for a second that Hegel's, Hegel makes sense in logic. Right. Right. Maybe there, like the organization of that in Farsi would be different. The introduction would be different. The way it is communicated is different. Um, maybe it needs a different type of association with you know, yeah, just like other resources that are available in that language. But I don't think the essence of it would be just something that is tied to German. Just because German is good for its expression. There's no founding, that doesn't add any founding principle about the relation between being and thought. Right. It seems to be a far more basic problem than a German problem. So I, I rest my case.
Yes, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for what you said. It's, it's fascinating. I have some responses and, and I think uh, we'll just uh, throw some perhaps the questions to the, out and we'll wrap it up. Then probably we can do more episodes on like a translation theory stuff in the future or cross-cultural interpretation. Yes, I think this is highly relevant. First is, um, I think this, what we talked about, the language situation, and to what extent Hegel's project of logic is conditioned or enabled or facilitated, or is just an expedient means and it doesn't really matter to like by by his um, given his position in um, the German speaking community, um, is connected with the again. Uh, universal and in the individual problem because mm -hmm. in the enlightenment and the content enlightenment basically the the, the uh, launching episodes of the, of the whole project the Fazuha project we we dealt with um Haman Herder languages thing it's like all the if you take the Gardamus that approach the criticism seriously, then what is a language? It cannot be essentialized. All you get is an individual speech, and in the sense that nothing really makes sense. And um, of course, the Gardama didn't go that far, but it is again a balance between universality and individuality. And for me, I think the ground, the starting point, or the, the uh, most important categories of what Hegel's project, like being and a thought. Hegel would put them in the universal end of such a spectrum, in the sense that even a language does not put such, does not verbalize it or does not put it on the forefront, is still connected with the fundamental need of human com communication. So go back to our previous episode on um, our Fazur quote unquote charge or curiosity about. Um, the um, project of logic is it limited to his time for his place for his people or is it intended as a so-called modernity project that whenever a community has entered into that stage of sophistication then it will have the potential to deal with this project regardless of native language and i have one very brief like example to 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 perhaps back this the suspicion up that or guess up that uh, he's looking at more in the uh, universal side in, in linguistics there is a distinction between a creole and a pidgin language and pidgin language is basically a person who is like uh, thrown into a new linguistic community and he's learning basically broken english like a one car come one car go two car pom pom one car die that's how a pidgin speaker would give testimony to a traffic policeman describing a traffic uh, incident. Um, and once people are born into that community raised by, say, pigeon speaking parents, they usually would start their like symbolic world with words from that pigeon, uh, not really so called rationalized the relationship across the words. And within one generation, as long as you got a native speaker of a pigeon, they would just sort of supplement the language make it capable of all kinds of sophisticated science, like quantum mechanics, like Hegel's science, whatever. And then makes the transition from a pidgin language into a, not even language, it's a speech or form of speech into so-called the Creole language. Like you have examples of such, and then again, your favorite example, South Pacific, like uh, um, certain French um, islands, and especially Ile de Réunion, I think this is where the term Creole itself is from. It's like, it's, it's, it's such a social linguistic um, study, so that for me at least, that suggested to a stratum of at least the possibility, it's not something for it to disregard the universality of a certain basic concepts that language users across the world are grappling with, whether regardless of the centrality they, they give to a specific concept, like being a thought. That's why certain languages that do not prioritize as such um, abstraction, quote unquote, as much as like 19th century German did, does not make Hegel's project, in my eyes, intranslatable into that linguistic community. Of course, I agree with you, translating cultures, cross-cultural interpretation and comparison are really difficult and really 
um, needs the language user to be very self-critical and um, uh, what is really begotten or uh, created there, was it more a direct importation or is a cross-cultural transcreation? That's a question we should like think more and through reading perhaps translation theory and to really talk about specific terms in like empirical sense to really uncover. But at this moment, I think it's just irresponsible and it's uh, insufficient by pointing out the fact that Hegel was speaking German and writing in German. Therefore, by nature, his project is restricted to the German speakers. I think in that line of thinking is itself a presupposition that is not subjected to uh, empirical um, scrutiny, but for, for for the empirical part, we can add it later. But I think we have a, already come up to our at least a reaction to such charges against the impossibility of Hegel's project. Yes, and I think the the point about translation is something that we're gonna um, talk about in in uh, later on. But I I really enjoyed the connection that you make with the categories of universality and individuality. And I think that's a very important, that's one of those areas that is so central in understanding all sorts of things. And right. in, in, in this whole point about um, translation from one culture to another culture is this becomes uh, super important. I think we have uh, talked enough about the impossibility and we have tried our best to show you guys that this, these charges of impossibility are all coming from the position of mentioning this or that enabling presupposition. And none of them really touches the founding presuppositionlessness that Hegel is aiming at. What is going to happen next is that we are going to take upon another charge which is not so much about impossibility, but it is about an attitude towards concepts in general, that Hegel has a very basic misunderstanding of what concepts are, and that makes this whole inquiry not impossible, but just house of cards with no really meaning attached to this project. It becomes a game that is empty and that emptiness is something that we are gonna um, deal with next time. Till then, uh, So the listeners, good to be with you guys. Till next time, bye-bye.